parents have way less influence than we think on our kids' destiny. This means you can give your ego a rest, do your best every day, dispense unconditional love, and give them all the support they need for their own journey. But I saw my friend the other day. I said, how you doing? He says, I'm trying to be a better parent. What a cool answer. I think the comment alone speaks volumes about his interest, his passion, his desire to do the best he can, the self-awareness that he's <laughs> fighting the battle every step of the way and uh, being self-reflective. I thought it was really cool. And so we got to talking about the wonderful concept of parenting. And I thought I'd do a whole show on it. Uh, he's trying to raise toddlers right now. So um, different perspective than I have with my both my kids in their mid-20s, adults. And um, one of the things he mentioned was the patterns that he learned from his own childhood and his desire to avoid the undesirable uh, experiences that he had and um, also to model the positive stuff that he felt uh, was, was good that he received as a kid from uh, his parents. Um, he remembers how how effective it was for his peers to keep him in check. He was a high school football player in the big time Texas 5A football scene. And he recalls that if a player acted up in class, the teacher would say, I'm going to inform your coach about your misbehavior. Um, what a cool overall dynamic school community to have these things in place. But anyway, if a football player acted up, the coach would be informed, and then it would come to practice and the coach would say, due to the... <laughs> Uh, the uh, behavior report uh, from one of the players here, you guys are all going to run laps until you puke in the hot Texas sun. And then after the practice, uh, the full practice was over after the uh, the punishment session, um, there would be some uh, reinforcement in the locker room where the offender would hear about it from uh, the biggest, strongest players on the team. So with uh, uh, modern uh, high sensitivity hazing concerns aside, you can see how that whole dynamic worked very well to have very well-behaved high school football players uh, very quickly, everybody uh, towing the line thanks to that uh, peer influence. Um, what I told him uh, during our conversation with us, I was going to email him my favorite parenting article of all time. It's titled The Inverse Power of Praise, How Not to Talk to Your Kids. And it was published in New York Magazine in 2007. Uh, it honors the great work of uh, Stanford researcher Carol Dweck, author of Mindset. And I'll send a, uh, a link in the show notes to my blog article with my reflections on the article, as well as a link to the article. You can find the article easily. If you Google it, we'll also have that in the show notes. But honestly, I read the article when it came out in 2007, and I thought about it or have thought about it virtually every single day uh, from, from that point on, especially when I was in the midst of parenting my kids from, uh, youth ages into teenager, adolescent and so forth. And, um, I just, um, it, it really hit home with me and there's quite a bit of, uh, counter culture advice, controversial advice. So I'm going to lay it on you and see what you think. Um, but first I, I wanted to also put together my uh, my favorite or my most profound parenting insights, and we'll discuss those in an organized fashion uh, during the show. And my first one is that it seems like kids are overparented these days. What do you think? Yes, it's good to reflect upon these things, especially when we compare and contrast to uh, the, uh, the ages past where the parents weren't breathing down our neck so much. And it's just sort of a, a change and evolution of culture. Um, and if you just ignore it or just blindly forge ahead, you are going to follow the pack and the norms. And so what I told my friend is it's really good to sit back and reflect and realize if that this is the age of overparenting, maybe you can make a conscious decision to uh, swim upstream against these norms if you feel like in your heart and in your philosophical base that uh, maybe there's a better way, uh, which means 
Yeah, you do not have to help your kids with homework every single day. You don't have to quote marks in the air, help your kid work on their college essay uh, to the extent that you're sitting at the keyboard and the kid is uh, looking over your shoulder. Um, and it's a very uh, delicate balance. I think everybody would agree with these quips I'm making, but um, when you get down to real life circumstances and the day-to-day -day decisions, I felt like it was a challenge to go against the cultural norms. Um, it, because if you kind of do the, the, the hands-off parenting style of uh, decades past, it's very likely that your kid will fall behind this incredibly insane and competitive pace of what we're seeing today with the competitiveness uh, in every way in the world for uh, a spot on the athletic team or, of course, the prized college admission. Um, you know, when you when you think about a big picture, homework seems kind of like a d dumb idea these days when the kid is already in school for six hours a day. And we know conclusively that kids are not moving or exercising enough. And like Mark Bell said, the first kind of education should be physical education. But we have definitely put that aside and suppressed the importance of overall physical activity and an active lifestyle in favor of, in one uh, example, academic rigor. So if your kid's falling behind, um, you have a strong temptation to push them into the world of tutoring or the Kumon Math Center where you can take your kid uh, ostensibly after school for more math practice if they happen to be falling behind. It seems kind of ridiculous, but then when you look at the reality and realize that if your kid receives a B in any class in high school, they are very likely removing themselves from selection into the most popular University of California admissions. That's right. The average GPAs are so far above. It's 4.3, 4.5, 4.2 average, if you receive even a single B in high school, you will remove yourself from that selection pool. And that's happening right around us. It's crazy. It's amazing, but it is happening. And these are fine, affordable universities that are very uh, selective and prestigious to get into. So you don't want to mess around if that's the the the, the kid's goal. Um, we'll talk about that further um, and how the kid's natural destiny is the thing that's really going to come out. But um yeah, it, it becomes a, a challenging thing to realize and shake your head and scoff at the the pace and the competitiveness, but it is what it is. And uh, the same for sports. I realized when my kid was in fifth grade and he was uh, having a great time excelling in the local community basketball league and almost to the point of being frustrated that it wasn't a competitive enough experience for him. And I said, okay, we have to go throw you to the wolves now and sign up for the AAU youth basketball track. And if you're familiar with that, just like in many other sports, like gymnastics and swimming and competitive soccer. It's very, very rigorous, very intense, starting at a young age. And that is the track that pretty much your kid is compelled to participate in if they even want to get a spot on the court come high school or let alone a dream of a college opportunity. So I kind of uh, gritted my teeth and um, uh, every step of the way tried to, um, uh, you know, nuance the overall vibe and experience by injecting uh, my, uh, you know, freewheeling and fun-loving attitude into the high-intensity competitive circumstances. But, whew, it's, um, it's a tough choice. Um, I really appreciated uh, during the Olympic uh, coverage watching the uh, very clever and uh, highly regarded uh, commercial from Hyundai. Um, you might see it, uh, but what they're showing is a series of parent-child interactions, obviously, while driving to sports practice or driving home with the car, uh, getting that cool product placement. Uh, but the conversations they were showing were kids having a, kind of a tough time in their sports and the parent uh, saying things like, I really want you to be happy and find what you love. 
Uh, another one was, hey, maybe it's time to take a break break as the kid's driving home from yet another frustrating sporting experience. So really off the track of what we usually see, especially in commercial settings. So we see the gymnasts falling and struggling, uh, the little wrestler kid getting mangled in practice, and then driving home with the parent and receiving these uh, supporting, loving, gentle comments. And then the final frame comes up with the tagline for the commercial, and it says on the screen, never give up then there's a beat then there's a beat and then they finish the uh, presentation never give up on finding what you love uh, i read further about the commercial and what the advertising world thought about it uh, here's a little quote from an article hyundai's campaign stands in stark contrast to those from other olympic sponsors nike recently unveiled its highly anticipated summer games ads which dig into the ruthless drive it takes to win Commercials narrated with relish by Willem Dafoe typically list negative qualities that are nevertheless shared by many sporting greats, including an obsession with power, an inability to be satisfied, and a lack of care for others' feelings. Woo! So we are programming this into the brains of parents and kids. We've been doing it for decades. I uh, made some extensive comments on another show about how, although I love Kobe Bryant and I love Tiger Woods, um, they have gone over the top so many times and embellished their, um, you know, their their training protocols and things simply for the purpose of perhaps uh, feeding their ego or intimidating their other competitors. And I was talking about how Tiger said that uh, he ran eight miles a day, uh, twice a day as one of his quips. And I'm like, nope, sorry, you didn't, pal. So why would you tell the world something that's not true? Same with Kobe, frequently going on about how if he finds out his competition is waking up at 5 a.m. to train hard, he'll simply wake up at 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. if necessary. And it's blather and it's nonsense and I don't like it and I'm calling it out. And again, many of those winning qualities that we see from the great legends, the most competitive people like Michael Jordan and Kobe are in that category of um, <laughs> worth second guessing. So great job by Hyundai to say to the kids and the parents, you know what? It is okay to quit. It's okay to quit in the middle of the season. It's okay to quit after uh, dedicating uh, hours and hours for years and years to your swimming career and then saying, yeah, I'm over this and I want to do something else. All right. So never give up on finding what you love. That's the section about overparenting, breathing down the kid's neck, choosing into these cultural norms instead of uh, taking a beat and thinking about, do I really have to do this? Um, and related to that is would be my um, probably my biggest takeaway of all now that my kids are in uh, the, uh, the adult scene uh, and reflecting back. My biggest takeaway is that parents have way less influence than we think on our kid's destiny. This means you can give your ego a rest, do your best every day, dispense unconditional love and give them all the support they need that uh, that they need and, and deserve for their own journey. But uh, the main realization that we need to uh, get here is that we have a distinct and powerful ability to screw them up, but their positives and their successes are going to be and must be largely self-directed in order for them to be happy, well-adjusted, content adult human beings, right? You can probably uh, drive a kid to the brink and have them excel in, in, in the competitive uh, world by pushing the crap out of them and breathing down their neck and looking over their shoulder every step of the way. Um, but I don't know if that's really a desirable outcome if you really want to uh, reflect on it. So the kids' success and their drive is going to be largely self-directed. Remember that great quote uh, from Wayne Gretzky when a parent came up to him and uh, asked, hey, Wayne, um, uh, how can I get my uh, little budding hockey superstar uh, to practice more? Do you have some suggestions? And Wayne Gretzky answered the parent, uh, no one ever had to tell me to practice more. <sighs> so 
the kid is going to pursue their natural destiny with the parent having less influence than you think. So sit down, take a deep breath, and really uh, reflect on uh, my comments here. Uh, I want to give you an example of my younger sister, Kathleen. Uh, she ended up to be valedictorian at Yale University. That was her natural destiny. Didn't happen to be her brothers, <laughs> but good for her. But along the way, I want to report that no one pushed her. No one even incentivized her. No one looked over her shoulder to check on her work. Of course they didn't. They wouldn't know what was going on with that uh, advanced math. And no one even had to lavish effusive praise upon her for every accolade that she received along the way. She was just following her own destiny. She had a passion. She had a drive. And it was natural. And it was, of course, supported by the parents and the family. But it was not orchestrated in any way. So your charge, your, uh, your, 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 your mission here, if you choose to accept it, is to be your kid's caddy with the golf analogy. You know what a caddy is? Right. The caddy carries the bag for the player. The caddy helps set the player up for success. The caddy will hand the player the requested club. Maybe they'll have a discussion together about whether it should be a seven iron or an eight iron, but the player has the last choice. Um, so you want to open doors for your kids, set them up, give them opportunities, and then stand back and watch them excel. Yeah, okay. Uh, keeping with this caddy analogy, maybe you can uh, demonstrate uh, show them how to hit that 150-yard high fade uh, into the wind. Uh, also, live your life and walk your talk, I think, is super, super important. So whatever influence we have on our kids, it's largely by doing rather than talking. And there's no faking that either. Um, I remember getting into an argument with some uh, a parents a while back who uh, like to party in the background uh, when they're while they're raising young kids, um, you know, maybe even in um, in the other room or while the kids are asleep. And I'm like, really? So you think this is going to be OK to uh, wish for your kids to have, let's say, a drug free or responsible high school experience while you are indulging, uh, you know, right around the corner? Um, that sounds like me being high and mighty. And I'm sure that um, that I, I will accept that characterization. Uh, but it did seem like a disconnect where you want your kid to be a certain way and you want to lecture them every day about that and then uh, not walk your talk. That's going to really diminish your credibility. So you're going to serve as your kid's caddy. You're going to realize that you have far less influence than you think you do, uh, but you're going to uh, strive to not cross over that line into the uh, lawnmower parent zone. You know, the, old, uh, the the typical characterization was the helicopter parent hovering over your kid, and then they uh, evolved it or, or progressed it to the lawnmower parent, right? You're mowing the lawn, you're mowing a strip of lawn for your kid to uh, walk through this. They don't have to struggle, suffer, or, um, you know, experience failure. Oh, boy. So, yes, yeah, stay away from the lawnmower parent zone. My favorite article, as I mentioned at the outset, the inverse power of praise. And I thought about it every single day, um, drawing heavily on Carol Dweck's work uh, in, in the book Mindset and the importance of cultivating a growth mindset in life, whereby you're not afraid to fail. You're not afraid to tackle new challenges. And what happens when you are effusively praising your kid for every little thing that they do, and as we uh, always complain about, every kid's getting a trophy, every kid's getting a prize, every kid's getting celebrated, and we're praising, praising, praising them, uh, what happens often is we praise uh, the results they achieve, and thereby they develop a protection protective mindset where they are resistant to tackling new challenges that might be uh, difficult and result in some failure and setbacks because they're protecting those characterizations that the parents are feeding them every single day. You're such a great athlete. You are so smart. You are amazing at math. You are a natural artist. When you spew this kind of commentary towards your kid, I know it's well-meaning, I know it's coming from love, but it has the potential effect of uh, diminishing their growth mindset and making them resistant to new scary challenges that might challenge or that might uh, uh, counteract the uh, blather, the effusive praise. Uh, I told you the story about pulling my kid from the 
uh, fun and games of the community recreational basketball league into going with the, uh, the, 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 the tigers and the savages in the AAU basketball journey. Um, if I was just effusively praising him every day after he uh, scored a bunch of points in the community league, you're a great basketball player. You're amazing. You're so naturally talented. And he went to his first practice and got blown off the court by guys that were twice his size when they were all 10 years old. Um, that would not have worked very well, right? He would immediately uh, have been you know, uh, uh, devastated due to this artificially propped up self-esteem. Same with when uh, your kid goes off to a more selective academic experience experience or they start, the class starts getting more difficult and first they were bringing home A's and receiving effusive praise and getting 50 cents for every A and a dollar for every A plus, whatever. That's the kind of stuff that can crumble like a house of cards because it's not uh, uh, optimal according to the greatest researchers in the world like Carol Dweck and that importance of cultivating a growth mindset. Um, so think about this. Um, you do not really need to praise results. Yes, you can praise effort, or as Ashley Merriman, my uh, former podcast guest, whose work was also referenced in this article, uh, her book with Poe Bronson, Top Dog, uh, The Science of Winning and Losing, and also uh, Nurture Shock, her book about, uh, her and Poe Bronson's book about uh, the science of parenting, uh, and lots of the uh, similar commentary. Uh, and anyway, um, uh, you want to praise effort that are that is made toward improvement, not just blindly praising effort because if your kid makes the effort to do homework for three hours while <laughs> TV is blaring in the background and they're um, handling their mobile device, that's not really a worthy effort. So you are allowed to praise effort toward improvement. You can praise their character. I'm proud of uh, uh, the man that you've become, but you want to really uh, be careful praising results. Um, because this is what sets you up for that protective mindset versus the ideal growth mindset. Furthermore, uh, think about it. Praising these results is kind of unnecessary and potentially takes the uh, the enjoyment and the satisfaction away from the kid and rather turning them into a show pony performing for their parents' amusement and satisfaction and ego, right? So if your kid hits the winning three-pointer at the buzzer um, and you're uh, driving them home after the, uh, uh, the wonderful experience, do you really need to verbalize how awesome it was for your kid to drain that three-pointer or to say something as innocuous and loving as it sounds, I'm really proud of you for stepping up and burying that three-pointer. You don't really need to do that. The kid is already awash in uh, satisfaction, uh, happiness, excitement, and praise from uh, the peers and everyone who watched the game, and the parent interjecting and trying to weasel their way into um, an ego boost uh, has potential to uh, take the take the satisfaction away. Allow the kid to bask in their own success and own it entirely, rather than saying, I'm proud of you. Every time you think about saying, I'm proud of you, think about the possibility of rephrasing that to, you should be proud of yourself. You should be proud of yourself. You came through under pressure, even after that rough first half, or you missed a bunch of shots, whatever you want to say, you should be really proud of yourself for graduating high school, graduating college, getting the lead role in the play, whatever it is. Not, I'm proud of you. You should be proud of yourself. I told you I've been thinking about this stuff every day. That's why I'm hitting you uh, so aggressively with this, because we hear this now. Now that I'm uh, so uh, programmed accordingly, I hear people say left, right, and upside down. I'm really proud of her. She's really done a great job at her career. I'm really proud of her. She graduated in four years on time. I'm really proud of him. He made the A team on soccer instead of the B team. Uh, how many goals did you score in the process of um, your, your kid making the A team instead of the B team? That's right, zero. So why are you proud? You didn't do anything. Uh, you fed the kid and drove him to practice. You're the caddy, and that's great. The kid should be proud of themselves. Now we take this theme further into the a point of getting possibly a little controversial. I've experienced some pushback when I've shared these ideas with other parents, uh, but I think the article and possibly uh, the book goes into this further where um, if you do something uh, so innocuous as telling, uh, especially uh, let's talk about daughters in, in the female realm here, um, 
you're so pretty seems like um, something nice and warm and loving to say that'll boost your daughter's self-esteem, but it can also risk her trafficking on her physical appearance and uh, absorbing the unhealthy influences by the related cultural forces. You get what I'm saying? I'm trying to say it um, with big words here, but if you keep telling your daughter how beautiful she is, there's a potential downside. That's all that the uh, the message is being conveyed here, especially as we are awash in um, comparative culture, right? And the long programming that we're carefully trying to unwind now as we become more conscious and more politically correct. Um, besides, again, just like uh, the example with sports, um, whatever a parent says will get overridden on the playground anyway. So if you keep telling your daughter, you're so pretty, you're so beautiful, you're going to, you're such a knockout. Oh, you're going to, you're going to drive the boys wild in, in five years. Ha ha ha. Isn't that a cute thing? Um, same with uh, telling the kid, you're such a great athlete. You're so amazing. You're such a talented artist. This stuff will soon become tuned out. Your kid will tune it out when they face the reality of the harsh uh, circumstances on the school playground it, to, to set that example, right? So um, those who are <laughs> destined to become professional athletes, supermodels, and uh, sensational uh, runaway sensation artists, they will start to intuit these things very early on in life, and they do not need any reinforcement or verbalization from the parent along those lines. In fact, what they probably need is to be brought down and uh, focused on becoming well-adjusted people if they are on the supermodel track or the professional athlete track. So uh, just think about those things as you try to uh, support your kid and boost their self-esteem and all those kind of things. Um, yeah. And guess what? Uh, be careful what you wish for as well with your kid's uh, journey through life because uh, being an NFL player or being a supermodel or being a valedictorian or being a runaway sensation artist is no guarantee of happiness or contentment or satisfaction or being a well-adjusted, nice, kind person. So focus on the latter rather than boosting them up and propping them up with a blather commentary. Uh, this gets me to uh, one of my favorite parenting uh, analogies, and that is to uh, to be the traffic cop, uh, because one of the things my friend was talking about at the outset was, you know, uh, trying to unwind that potentially harmful uh, childhood programming of his own and model the good stuff that he experienced. He says, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to raise my voice. That happened to me a lot when I was a kid. And I can I can know I know it's uh, has negative uh, aspect, uh, but I'm, I'm I'm doing my best. Um, so I, I recalled my, my traffic cop analogy because when you are speeding on the road and you get pulled over uh, by the traffic cop, they come up to your window and they say, I pulled you over because you're going 82 in a 65 zone. Uh, can I have your license and registration, please? Whew, busted, huge fines ahead. Um, traffic school, a lot of hours, uh, penalty, and the cop need not say anything else besides license and registration, please. What you don't get when you're pulled over is a cop racing up to your window and yelling and screaming at you with a lecture. Don't you see how dangerous that is? Do you know what kind of carnage I see out here every day? How dare you endanger the lives of other drivers? Da, 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 da. Um, maybe some cops. I don't, I don't think many, but you get the analogy here is that you have the, uh, uh, the, the, the guidelines, the boundaries, the rules, and then you have what's called a natural consequence. So if you're speeding on the road, you get pulled over and fined. That's a natural consequence of speeding. Do you want to keep doing that? Do you want to keep paying those massive fines and going to traffic school? Uh, that's going to be the best incentive to obey the laws of the land when you're driving. And it's going to be vastly superior to some cop coming up to your window and berating you for how dangerous of a driver you are. And imagine this as we take this uh, parenting analogy deep. What if the cop, what if that's all they did was pull you over? run up to your window, scream at you for a couple minutes, point their finger at you, warn and threaten you that uh, next time you're going to have, uh, you know, a hell to pay and then send you along <laughs> without uh, giving you a ticket 
or anything of the sort. This is what happens a lot in the parenting situation where we have, I mean, I see this dialogue out in public and boy, it's it's kind of heartbreaking because you, uh, you see the parent lecturing the heck out of the kid and uh, using harsh words and criticism and tone of voice, uh, but you don't see consequences uh, being enforced uh, right on the spot. Um, so it kind of occurs to me that oftentimes we treat um, our kids like adults and we treat them like adults when we should treat them like kids. We treat them we treat them like uh, kids when we should treat them like adults, the, the, vice versa. You get what I'm saying? So uh, when a kid is whining and having a meltdown while you're trying to uh, finish off your shopping at Target and you hear the parent saying, come on, I've been driving around and doing things for you all day. You're really annoying the heck out of me. Why don't you be quiet? We're almost home. Uh, just hang in there. You know, that's treating a kid like an adult, where if you have a kid uh, whining and melting down in a public place, what you do is remove yourself and get them home for a nap. Um, <laughs> I learned this really well when my kids were young, and therefore they didn't melt down hardly ever because I didn't push them too hard uh, for my own agenda and my own uh, shopping errands necessary. And then um, there's there's a time when you can treat them with uh, respect and bring them into the, for example, example, the, the discipline and the boundaries and the decision making by saying, uh, for example, uh, having a conversation with your teenager saying, what do you think is a fair curfew? Uh, 2 a.m. Well, guess what? I think midnight is much better or 1115, whatever. But you do have a dialogue. And then you also can go over things like, what do you think the punishments and the consequences to be? What do you think is fair to you? I don't know. Uh, lose an hour of uh, mobile device use. Eh, and well, I'm the parent, I have the last say, so how about a day of mobile device loss if you forget to do uh, the dishes at night? And so everyone agrees, it's like the cooperative parenting approach rather than the uh, arguably flawed and dated approach of saying, uh, why do I have to do this? And the, uh, the pat answer being, because I said so, is not going to be as effective overall. Similarly, if the uh, punishment is not aligned. If it's not a natural consequence of the offense, what you're going to do is uh, 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 build up uh, resentment, and that stuff doesn't uh, come out too well uh, as the ages uh, increase. So a resentful 10-year-old is going to be a pain in the butt a little bit, but a resentful 17-year-old, um, just like the George Michael song, I'm big enough to break down the door. Uh, uh. Yeah, we don't want to uh, mess with a uh, creating a resentful 17 year old who's been, uh, you know, dominated and diminished for years and years through discipline and punishment. That's not a recipe for um, cooperative parenting or uh, loving, healthy family dynamics. OK, so be the traffic cop, uh, assess those penalties and those natural consequences and um, uh, don't do something that's unrelated because that's what's going to create resentment. Uh, I read this insight from uh, one book, I think it was Dr. William Hughes. He said, um, consider you know, the, the common punishment of grounding. Uh, maybe that's not the best punishment because as a teenager, the most important thing to them is their freedom and their connection with their peers. And if you take that away uh, due to not doing the dishes or whatever the reason is, um, it's going to create resentment because they don't see that connection of losing their freedom. Um, uh, uh, secondly, um, the idea of uh, punishing your individual child by uh, removing them from a team experience like, okay, that's it. You're missing the game this weekend because you didn't do the dishes or uh, otherwise broke the house rules. Then you're kind of bringing the punishment in and affecting others. So we want to try to get away from that. So, um, yep, you're going to still play in the game, but after the game, instead of going out to the pizza place and celebrating with your team, you're going to come home and you're going to uh, sweep the driveway and polish the stairs. You get the difference there. Um, uh, same with the speeding, uh, the cop yelling at you or just giving you a ticket and sending you along. So that cooperative approach, I favor that. I think that's really effective where the kid has to say they feel like um, they're respected. They feel like uh, an adult in that circumstances when, uh, as I was trying to describe before. And, um, you know, good luck with that. And of course, the parent has the final say. So it's not like, oh, <laughs> my kid chose a curfew of two and uh, I really wanted 12. So I wonder where he is now because it's 2, 10 a.m. No, no, no. It's not what I'm talking about at all. Um, so in summary, 
the first thing I mentioned was the uh, cultural trend of overparenting and perhaps uh, taking the time to reflect and make decisions that may, will potentially require you to swim upstream. Uh, then the second thing I talked about was the, the realization that you have far less influence than you think, and instead you want to uh, allow the kid to pursue their natural destiny. Maybe they'll be valedictorian of an Ivy League university. Maybe college won't really be the thing for them. And that's absolutely fine because of the uh, competitiveness and the selectivity. And so, uh, you know, be open to the idea that just like on the Hyundai commercial, you want your kid to do whatever it takes to find uh, what what makes them happy. All right. Uh, and uh, realize, again, with uh, the foundational article, uh, the inverse power of praise, is that you have a distinct and powerful ability to screw them up, but this effort to continually uh, boost self-esteem with unnecessary praise and potentially uh, counterproductive and extremely counterproductive praise uh, is really important. And I strongly encourage you to uh, read my blog article with further thoughts and read the article itself. And then finally, when it comes to discipline, be the traffic cop. There's no need to inject uh, raising your voice or unnecessary emotion, criticism, or negative energy. You just establish the, uh, the boundaries and the natural consequences and... That's a wrap. I wonder what you think about that. This would be a great blog post uh, to uh, get some uh, community comments on, and maybe I'll do a follow-up uh, Q&A show. So I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen, reflect, and I'd love to know uh, some of your own personal parenting experiences. Thank you.